future Hall of Famer Joe Thomas, yes, the legend, on the show to talk about what is up with some of these offensive lines to start 2020. And I try to convince Mark Ingram to convince Jameis Winston that eating W's is vile. It starts now. Go. Joe Thomas welcoming the show right now. 10,363 consecutive snaps, six time first team all pro. It's so much to say, Joe. It's so much to say. <laughs> well, we like it that way, Kay. Thanks yeah. for having me on. It's uh, It was a great, enjoyable career in Cleveland, but being able to work with the great people like Kay Adams, the best in the business, it's even better than going out and smashing my head around on Sundays. 17 times a season. Yeah, I mean, so some would say that's not true and that they could use you, and you are just an absolute legend instead. And speaking of that, you are joining the exclusive Browns Legends Club. It's all going on this weekend. You're one of the best offensive linemen in all of history. How are you feeling about that? So well-deserved. Congratulations. Yeah, it's really exciting being one of the members of the Browns Legends Club, which if you're a Browns fan, you understand how many great players have worn that Browns uniform throughout the years. It's not just... Jim Brown and Otto Graham, but mm. going all the way through the modern guys like the Bernie Kozars and the Doug Deacons, the guys that, you know, people that were my parents' age watched take the Browns on the edge of a Super Bowl several times uh, and hopefully maybe some Super Bowls here in the future. Oh, I would love I mean, listen, the Browns got to win out the gate. Almost everyone counting them out. Is this a team that you can see sort of staying in the playoff race? Yeah, I think they're going to be right there. They've got one of the best defenses in the NFL. They've got the best run game in the NFL. Obviously, everybody knows Deshaun Watson's going to be out the first 11 games of the season. But Jacoby Brissett, we think he could play better. Uh, he didn't have a great week one, and they still won. And what he does really well and brings to the Browns is he's not going to make a lot of mistakes. And I think as he gets more comfortable with this offense and the core of receivers that he has, he's going to start making those plays that were out there against Carolina, but he just did not connect on them. If he makes two throws that are easy, wide open throws yeah. to Amari Cooper um, and Kareem Hunt on the sideline, that's 14 points right there. And if the Browns defense doesn't have brain fart on two deep passes from Baker Mayfield, you win by four touchdowns. Yeah. What did you, you make of Baker up against his old team? Yeah, I thought he was kind of the Baker that Browns fans have seen for four years, right? He was tough. He was gritty at times. He was very accurate. He showed that big arm that he had on a couple big throws. But um, in the end, there was a lot of bad at the beginning, and there was some good towards the end. He kind of hung in there really tough, but a lot of drop, a lot of uh, knockdown passes. And so I think one of the things that the Carolina Panthers coaching staff is going to realize is that Baker's at his best when he's outside the pocket, when he's got an opportunity to move and where he could see down the field because he's not a tall quarterback. And so throwing quick passes from in the pocket and trying to see him deliver the football down the field like a traditional pocket passer is just not a sweet spot. You got to find out what he does well and then try to amplify it. Joe Thomas bringing it on a Wednesday morning. Uh, the Browns, speaking of that, you'll be there, of course, celebrating this great honor this weekend. And they are celebrating a new logo on the field. Did you see this? I need to get your thoughts, Joe. <laughs> I mean, what's more intimidating than a 30-foot <laughs> snarling angry elf at midfield of your football field? Uh, I love it. I think the Browns fans love it. They all voted on it. It was the runaway winner in the poll that I think the Cleveland Browns official Twitter page put up there. And, you know, certainly there's going to be people laughing at it around the league. Ah, oh, you've got a Keebler elf at midfield, but <laughs> who doesn't love the Keebler elf? Like, nothing. just happy thoughts. When I see the Keebler Listen. elf, I think about all those delicious cookies. Fudge so either stripes. way, it's a win-win. Fudge stripes are delicious. You, when's the last time you had a Keebler cookie, Joe? Look at you. Ooh, every now and then you got to have those cheat days, you know, keep the mind and the body happy at the same time. So I was a, I was like a grasshopper guy, you know, oh, yeah. uh, the Thin Mint, Girl Scout cookie, the grasshopper, Keebler elf cookie. It's all the same. It's all delicious. I don't believe that you eat anything like that. I literally don't believe you. <laughs> uh, okay. This this weekend, week celebrate. one, week one was, is now over. Biggest takeaway, go wherever you want with this one, just from week one. Yeah, so there was a lot of really interesting games, obviously, but there was a guy that I really wanted to highlight, and he's playing for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's a rookie. He's the Greek freak. Not the Greek freak that the NBA fans know about, uh, but George Karloftis. Les, hit the light. Actually was a member of the Greek national water polo team as a kid, and I think what he proved is that when you're rushing the passer, it's not all about 
being the biggest, the fastest, the guy that tests the best at the combine. But heart, desire, effort, technique, those are the things that make the difference when you're trying to get to the quarterback because right. the difference between a sack and a pressure is very, very small. The difference between a pressure and not even being close to the quarterback is also very, very small. And a lot of times effort and desire make the difference. And he showed it with six pressures in his first NFL game. And no other rookie, by the way, had more than three. And you just said the number six. And let's not forget where he was taken in this draft at the end of the first round. So already proving to be maybe one of the better values. And I love that you're giving George K some love here on yeah, Up and Adams. Let's get to that more offensive line talk here. I don't know how to put this, Joe. Your position group is uh, going through a bit of bad PR after week one. The Cowboys, the Bengals, the Bucks, the Rams, the Packers. What did the quarterbacks do to offensive linemen around the league this season that they are not protecting them like they should? Well, offensive line play has a lot of factors that are at play here when you're talking about their performance. And primarily, it comes down to the quarterback being on the same page with your offensive line and the quarterback being on the same page with his receivers, right? Which sometimes that doesn't always make sense, but understanding that how long I have to block my guy directly is related to how the chances of the quarterback are going to be getting hit. Mm. So if you look at a quarterback that's understanding what the defense is doing, he's understanding where his receivers are, and he's delivering the football on time and on the money, that makes my job easy. All I got to do is lay down on the ground and be a speed bump for a second and a half to two <laughs> seconds So if you play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you're going to look like you're playing at a, a Hall of Fame level. If your quarterback is a little bit indecisive, he's seeing the secondary. You're blaming the quarterback. That's a lot. Last thing. Absolutely. It's always the quarterback's fault, no matter what happens. Uh, if that secondary is moving at the last second, all of a sudden he's holding on to the ball. He's double clutching. He's trying to scramble. Now your guy's making the hit. And a lot of times we used to laugh because we'd be winding the film back uh, when we were watching in meetings. And we'd say, this guy, look at this. He just threw six no hitters, but nobody knows because <laughs> Peyton Manning's back there throwing the ball in a second and a half. And this guy just had the worst performance of an offensive lineman the entire season, but nobody knows about it. And then all of a sudden you got a quarterback that's maybe indecisive. A lot of times that's what you get with the young quarterbacks and they're holding on to the ball and you miss two blocks and all of a sudden it's two sack fumbles. And now you're the goat and the guys in, that are watching in Japan think you're the worst <laughs> offensive lineman in the NFL. It's, it's just not fair, but it's the world we live in. It's that's not what we call it. Oh, life is so tough for the offensive line. Yeah, do you think, do you on. think up, you know, uh, we had Jeff Schwartz on yesterday and he was saying, listen, the Chiefs play all their starters and everyone, when I had, I had four preseason games, do you, did you find it necessary to play in the preseason? So I liked playing in the preseason when I had the chance to. Later in my career, I was too banged up to be able to do it. But I truly I enjoyed it. I felt like it was important from two aspects. One, like the conditioning side of it. Because when your adrenaline is up, your heart rate is up, your blood pressure is already up, you run out of gas a lot quicker. And so you go on a couple of those 10 mm -hmm. or 12 play drives. That's just something that you don't see as much in training camp. You can't really replicate that intensity. Right. You have to see it on game day, right? And I think the other thing is, just getting the speed of the game, which is different when you're tackling guys to the ground. And I think getting your mind up to the speed of the game is really good if you have that opportunity. But with that being said, I think with the addition of the extra game, like you, you can't look at it any other way except for these games are a little bit less meaningful during the regular season. And so it makes sense if you feel yeah. like hey, we can get guys playing better football the last half of the season if we don't take the preseason with the same level of seriousness. Not that it's not serious, but you're not putting all your dudes out there and you're kind of easing their way into mm -hmm. the regular season a little bit and you find that you can get a little bit more out of them later in the season. I think that's a really good argument for saying, hey, let's take it easy on the front end because if we have to decide, do we want you at your best at the end of the season or the beginning of the season? I think most teams are going to say, we'd rather have them at their absolute best and freshest at the end of the season. You sound like an NFL coach. Like that is, because that's the decision, right? I'm risking injury to my players. If they're, if they're out there and they're not putting 100% of themselves, that's an easy way to get injured. Uh, so it's this fine line you have to walk. And that was a really good explanation of it. Uh, call your shot here. Best offensive line group right now. Well, that was a great tee up there, Kay, because I actually think if you look at the Eagles, they're one of those teams that have taken it really easy in preseason. And last season, you look at their injuries, they hardly had anybody injured and they played their best football at the end of the season. 
And so I think there is something to be said about how they manage their players in preseason. But I think the Eagles have the best offensive line in the NFL because they have no weaknesses. It's also because they're they're not injured because yeah. they do things the right way during training camp. If you look at their tackles, they probably have the best duo of tackles in the NFL, Jordan Mailata and Lane Johnson. Lane Johnson been doing it for a long time at right tackle. Jordan Mailata, he's one of the it's most insane. fun stories in the NFL. The dude did not play a snap, not one snap of American football before he was drafted in the seventh round by the Eagles. 6'8", 365-pound Australian rugby player. First two years in the NFL, doesn't play a snap. All of a sudden, he comes in, and he's made this amazing transformation. And he's one of the highest-rated offensive linemen in the NFL. He picked up right where he left off last week. Yeah. Their interior three, all really good. Of course, everybody knows Jason Kelsey, the perennial all-pro. So no weaknesses, Eagles. great depth. And those guys can lean on you and they can pound on you. I mean, they had four rushing touchdowns. That's you. You did whatever you just said is is too much for me. I saw I saw four rushing touchdowns. Not only that, Joe Thomas from four different players. To me, that says it's clicking. The offensive line is great and one of the best, if not the best, which is what, no, now it is the best. And you're saying it is. So you know, I'm just going to listen to what you say because you're the goat. Uh, I want to show you a play that was highly controversial on Twitter. It's Leonard Fournette up against Micah Parsons. I don't know. Well, I don't know if this is not it. I don't believe. But oh, here it is. Oh, here we yeah. go. Yeah. So oh. this is going on. So t talk me through this because here I want to come back on camera for a second. Then we c if we can please uh, recue that and play it. This is a, you know, Leonard Fournette chip on Micah Parsons. You kind of played both sides on this one. On Twitter, I saw Joe. You didn't, I need you to tell me, is this clean or not? It's clean. That's your answer. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean it's fair. It's not a fair fight when you're a defensive end and you're being blocked by a tackle and all of a sudden a running back smokes you right in your chest <laughs> when you're not looking. However, it's part of the game. Like, as a really good defensive end, which Micah Parsons is one of the best, he's got to know that they're not going to just allow a run-of-the-mill tackle to block you one-on-one -on -one all game, like you're going to have chips coming from all different directions. You're going to have tight ends coming in motion and hitting you. You're going to have running backs come out of the backfield. Yeah. You're going to have receivers. Like that's just part of the game. So you got to have that awareness to see more than just the guy in front of you. And so I think it's up to you as a defensive end to understand like when that chip is coming and to be able to protect yourself. It's the same thing like it's not fair on the football field. If you're a receiver, the rules with you and a defensive back and how much holding and touching and grabbing you can get away from from a defensive standpoint, it's not fair. But that's just the game of football. Just like if I have to go one on one against Miles Garrett and everybody's sliding the other way, like the rules are slated in his favor. What he right. can do to get to the quarterback gives him a, a much wider range of options than me as an offensive tackle yeah. who can't hold. I can't grab, I can't tackle him, but he can do all those things to me. You gotta love, I mean, you, you gotta love seeing your running back step up to the plate like that and get it done. They're, they're yeah. screaming in my ear, rate that chip, go for it. Rate that chip, that's A+. plus. That's as good as it gets. It reminds me of Clinton Portis. He was so good at this back in the day. Chris Samuels was his left tackle. I remember watching them when I was a, a young player and <laughs> how many times that Clinton Portis would just smoke that defensive end. And as linemen, we love it, right? Because it gives that defensive end something to think about more than just me. And the more things you can give him to think about, the slower he's going to react to stuff. You're amazing. I have a couple more for you. I know you've got a busy weekend. Uh, Chiefs and Chargers, I would be remiss to my friend if I didn't ask you about Bosa and Mac because from my perspective, handling one is a lot. How do you deal with two dudes like this? This is another level of tandem. How do you manage? So when you have one pass rusher, like this is sort of your ceiling. And as soon as you have two pass rushers, what that does is it raises the ceiling for both of those guys. Because if you think about it, you got five offensive linemen, so you got to split up five blockers in some manner. And if there's four down linemen, you're going to usually say, okay, if this is the best dude, we're always going to at least have three eyes or three dudes blocking those two dudes. And a lot of times what you want to get is a two on one to make sure that that guy's not going to be able to get to the quarterback. But as soon as you have two studs on the edge, think back Robert Mathis and Dwight Freeney, like that great combo. Now your offensive line has to decide which direction they want to slide when you're in those five men type protections. And so it almost always gives you a one on one. And what the defense can do is they can set up their structure, their defense to be able to get those one on ones in predictable situations. So now Nick Bosa knows like, 
or, yeah. or Joey Bosa knows like, hey, this situation is set up for me when the back is set away. I know that they're going to be sliding in that direction to Khalil Mack. I know I'm going to get a one-on-one. -on -one. Now I can take that inside B gap on the pass rush because that guard's not going to be sitting there because I know he's turning in the opposite direction. So now it opens up my uh, book, my tool belt yeah. of pass rush moves more than just having to run up the field. So that's a big key for those guys, especially on those third down, those got to have it situations when they're thinking, Hey, sack, 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 this ends the game. Now you can start pulling out those things that you didn't show during the preseason because you're holding for those big moments during the season. I could listen to you all day. You are incredible. A hall of fame speaker about. and a student of the game. If <laughs> I will now, before I let you go, your eligibility is coming up in 2023. I'm not going to dig too much into it. Cause I know that there's a, it's still early in the process, shall we say, but how much have you thought about getting that knock on your door? Mm -hmm. Well, people ask about it a lot now that I'm going to be on the ballot this yeah. year. And, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that um, thinks it's a, a superstitious or faux pas to talk about. Um, I think I'm a good candidate. Uh, I think I, I did some good things in Cleveland for 11 seasons. <laughs> yeah. Hope I get a chance to be there at the Super Bowl and find out with my family. And if that happens, it's going to be a very special moment for myself, for my family, and certainly all of the Cleveland Browns fans. And uh, look forward to hopefully someday being in the Hall of Fame. You are universally beloved, even by the pass rushers who you made look silly out there <laughs> year in, year out. Such a steward of the game. Thank you for joining me. Enjoy your weekend. I hope that there's golf and family and all sorts of fun activities involved. Congratulations on the induction uh, as a Browns legend into that club this weekend and enjoy the startling elf there on the field. Mm. Thanks for having me on, Kay. There's going to be plenty of golf and beer this weekend. <laughs> I can assure you of those things. Joe Thomas, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Future Hall of Famer Joe Thomas, I should say. We have so much to get to on the show after this. I get into it with Mark Ingram. We chopped it up a little bit earlier, had a nice discussion, talked Saints, talked Ravens, talked Lamar Jackson after this uh, right here on Up and Adams. And I would think we would have, that. no, great. See ya. Back on Up and Adams, how great is Joe Thomas? Incredible, keep your tweets coming at Up and Adams. Uh, listen, I've talked to a lot of NFL players, very few bring me more joy than a running back Mark Ingram. He's currently in his 12th season in the NFL. I can't even believe that. And in talking to him, I found out he's more motivated than ever. We talked about the Saints, uh, his return there, Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas, Dennis Allen, and of course, Lamar Jackson. Take a look. How does it feel to be back there in that building? Man, it feels great uh, to come back home to a place where I started eight years of my career. Kind of had the little, you know, mix up but uh you know uh, my time in baltimore was great and then you know houston gave me opportunity but that all brought me back here so it comes full circle i'm happy to be back with my guys happy to be back in this organization happy to be back in the city when i think of the saints i think sean payton dancing in the locker room bringing in all that money all that cash yeah. that we yeah. what is it like without him man you know sean is uh you know irreplaceable you know what i mean but the good thing about people who are great leaders and you know and winners is they kind of leave a, a footprint they kind of leave a dna they kind of leave uh, a culture you know behind and uh the best thing to do was to hire da i mean he is he he knows what this culture is he knows what the dna is you know i think keeping the in-house keeping the um, things normal keeping things similar you know we're all still know each other we're all still accustomed to each other so we're just picking it up keeping it moving trying to get better we know yeah. we got a team that can do special things so what is the culture of the saints in 2022 man we just we some we some fighters man uh we believe in each other um you know it's little eye you know big team and um you know everyone has to just do their job to the best of their ability make your plays when your number's called and we love each other, we care about each other, we gonna have each other's back, and we ain't, we ain't quitting, we ain't giving up. We, we, we trying to be champions. So um, that's our mindset day in and day out, um, in our preparation, and in our, in, in our focus. And, um, you know, we just have a great belief in each other here, man. So uh, we're gonna have fun when we win. We was able to, you know, crank the locker room up, have the celebrity Tell coach in there. Yeah, yeah, we was able to crank the locker room up with the music and the lights and the smoke and had a celia and, uh, and a ATL. So, um, you know, we took over ATL, man. We just trying to do it one day at a time. You know what I mean? Is, so, is Dennis Allen dancing? Hey, man, we all in there. 
And, you know, and we all thriving for those moments. So, you know what I mean? We all enjoy those moments. We don't take those moments for granted. So we plan on doing those celebrations many, 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 many more times this year. You've been in this game a long time now and you still want to win. You still want to thrive. You like, What motivates you at this point? Uh, I just want to be the best, man. I still feel like I play this game at the highest level. I'm given the right opportunities in the right situation. So, um, yeah, I still I want to win a Super Bowl. I want to uh, do a lot of those things, man. Yeah. Still got personal, still got personal goals. So, um, still a lot of things driving me, man. My kids, my family, my wife, my my parents, my sisters, like everyone. You know, I got a lot of people who love me, care about me, believe in me. Talk to me about this wide receiver room because it went from zero to a hundred very fast. real quick, real, real quick. quick. Yeah, Tell zero to one hundred real quick. The wide receiver room is definitely one of the best in the league, man. I mean, we got those guys over there. I mean, you talk about Mike Thomas. Last time he played a full season was uh, Offensive Player of the Year. Um, you got Chris Olave, man, young, smooth, man. He, he's, he's cold, man. He's he's cold with it. I'm telling you, he's going to be one of those guys to watch for a long time. Then you got Juice Landry. I, I mean, I mean, that's just the name speaks for itself. He bring that juice. I got the J.U. Ice with me, you know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, What's it like working with Jameis Winston every day? Man, Jay Boo is that guy. You know what I'm I mean? Sorry, what is it? Uh, Jay Boo. Jay Boo. Yeah, Jay Boo wins. You know, that's his, yeah, that's his, that's his handle on IG, Instagram. Uh, on, yeah, all that. Jay Boo wins. But um, he's the man, bro. And like, what you guys see and think, like, you know, it's funny. Like, he's dead serious, man. He's super authentic. He's super genuine. Uh, he's very smart, man. And he's one of those guys that you want to fight for, man, because he cares about his teammate, his preparation, his work, and his skill set, man. He has the full package. Um, being a leader, both, you know, in the huddle, being encouraging to teammates, man. He's one of those guys, man, that you uh, want to go to battle with, for sure. We have been friends for years now. You have yeah. to get him to stop the, the fingers in the mouth thing. Hey man, that's Jay Boo. That's authentic. No, no, no. As a person, no, that's disgusting. Like you have like, <laughs> well, what's the fingers I, in the mouth? Well, first what, of all, it's what, first what, of all it's crazy. Dove? He does this thing, whatever it is, the dub. With the dubs, the E and the W. I stop, Mark. The E and the W. <laughs> but he does it like after a game when he's touching turf and spit and like God knows what else happens out on the field, and then he's putting his hands in his mouth. He eating that W. Ah. Is this the best? group of personalities in the NFL. The best man, I, personality. Man, I'm telling you, like, we got a whole bunch of alpha dogs on our team. Like, everyone's their own person. Uh, they're genuine, they're true, they're authentic to who they are. When you have that and you got guys that mesh like that, especially with the personalities we have, like you said, I mean, like, you just got some great dudes, some, some, some special characters, some one of ones on this team. And uh, I think it resonates through the whole team, through the entire organization, and that's why I think our team is special. That's different than most. You know what I mean? It's just the camaraderie, the love, the belief, and uh, that we have in each other. I know you know you're close to them. You got to see them up close and personal. What should happen with Lamar Jackson and the Ravens? Man, what should happen with Lamar, ja with Lamar Jackson is the man needs to get paid. Okay. You need to pay my dog. You need to pay my dog. Big trust. You feel me in the flesh, Lamar Jack. MVP. Now I would just like to introduce y'all to the man, the myth, the legend, the MVP front runner. If anybody else got to say something different about that, then come see me. Yeah. I'm right here in B-more outside the bank. If you got an issue with that, come see me. Wolfie. I'm about that. Wolfie. Big trust. Wolfie. Woo woo. Lamar Jackson <laughs> in the flesh. Big yes, sir. Big, big, big trust. <laughs> no, hey, I'm with you, I'm with you. Man needs to get paid. Um, he just went out there week one and just dialed it up, you know, throwing the ball, running the ball, typical Lamar Jack fashion. But, um, yeah, man, he gets, he deserves whatever he's asking for. He deserves the world, man. He's a hard worker. He's a great leader, and he's just a different type of guy, man, uh, playing quarterback, man. He can throw the ball. He, can run it. he won that huh? game against the Jets. He, he won the game against the Jets, and then he went to an elementary school and was talking to kids about what they want to be when they grow up. Like he's, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. I love different. this guy. If you don't yeah. like Lamar Jackson, you're truly a hater. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I be hearing all this Lamar Jackson slander. I just don't understand it. Like, I just don't understand it. You know what I, I mean? I think it's because he's one of one. He exactly. gets put into a, you know, we see what quarterbacks are and then Lamar is sort of his own category. But I like that, but I also don't think that at all because I, you know, my take on him is that every year I've seen him grow as a deep ball passer. I've seen him grow in reading defenses. It's everything you want out of a quarterback. And so he should be treated and paid like the Josh Allens and the homes of the world. He just should. 1,000% I'm with you, Kay. That's why you do That's why you real. 
Yeah, it's I, it's insane. But I mean, are you worried about him? Like what he's doing? Like, do you think like, no. a player, you know, he's doing, I don't like that he's doing it by himself, right? And I know he's got his yeah. mom and like, I just want to protect him. I don't want a Dak, you know, Dak Prescott injury that's going to derail what it, he should be right. paid. Like, listen, listen, like, yeah, he has a number. And if they would have given him a contract or a number he was happy with, he would have signed it. If you don't have a contract that doesn't give you the value or the comfort that you're looking for, you don't sign in, you bet on yourself. Yeah. So that's what happened and that's what he's doing. And now um, we all pray and that he goes through this season healthy, um, getting wins except versus the Saints. Okay. And um, you know what I mean? And he's passing it, he's willing, he's dealing it, and he just breaks the bank. We're going to do everything. Like, we'll even let him get to the Super Bowl, but versus the Saints in the Super Bowl, he can lose. <laughs> I'm a baller first, man. I'm out here toting this rock. We're trying to get ready for Sunday against the Bucks. Big game coming up. And um, you know, oh, but you gotta you gotta stay, you gotta stay versatile. You gotta stay tuned up. And um when they told me Kay had a little show that she was doing, I mean, it's only right that I jump on with my girl. You're the best. You're honestly the yeah. best. I need the sweatshirt. Big trust, Saints, Alpha Dogs. I learned a lot and you're I don't I don't I'm not. Don't eat the W's. That's all I ask. Yeah. Hey, and trust love cookies. Y'all, hey, wherever y'all get y'all podcast, you know what I mean? Trust level. Me and my boy Cam Jordan. You're the best. Is the best. The whole, I mean, the, literally the entire studio crew. It's early here on the West Coast. Everyone's smiling because that's what Mark Ingram brings to a locker room. And as, as you can tell, really motivated to keep going, to keep playing really well. Uh, they pulled out a win in week one, and we'll see what they could do. I love that he's wearing the, you know, he's sitting there at the Saints logo behind him, but he's still repping big trust. He's still talking openly as a veteran in the National Football League about a quarterback that he grew close to uh, and he loves, who looked good, by the way. Lamar Jackson, three touchdowns. They were beautiful. Two to DuVernay. One of them was a no look. You had Calais Campbell on the sideline saying, DuVernay's on my fantasy team. Why are we throwing in the rock with Sean Bateman? This is the hope. This was the hope for the Ravens. They'd find something in the passing game, and they're finding it in the young guys they brought in. So I'm also wishing Lamar all the best. And Mark uh, Ingram, you are amazing, and thank you for doing that. All right, we're going to have more on the show. We've got Fantasy Panic Room. What do you do with Christian McCaffrey, Cam Akers? Oh, Allen Robinson, yuck. But first, I want to get into some uh, underreactions. Why? Because everybody loves overreaction Monday, especially after week one. But here at Up and Adams, we are decided we are all about underreacting to storylines. So let's get it started. I've got a few of these here. A uh, lot of overreacting to the Packers offense. There's woes, shock, horror, the sky is falling. You know what though, I think we're underreacting to just how stifling this Vikings defense is and might be. So the story all week has been about the Packers offense missing Devonta Adams, none of the receivers stepping up, but I think we've underreacted to how good this defense is. So let's take a look here. I mean, even the numbers, five sacks, they beat up on Rodgers. They also came up with an interception. Rodgers only threw four interceptions last year. It doesn't happen. You know when the Vikings picked him off last? 2019. He had 181 pass attempts without an interception before that one. So Darius Smith, those images were amazing. I was loving it. He was stifling his friend Aaron Rodgers. Daniil Hunter was all over the place. They are legit. So the Packers offense might have to work some things out. But this Vikings defense looked incredible and deserves their credit. Okay, let's move on to another one. Davis Mills is underreacted to. I don't know why. I, maybe because it's the Texans. Maybe because they're in a rebuilding year. Uh, but they gave the Colts all sorts of problems. Let's get it going here. The Colts were the trendy pick to win the AFC South this year. The Texans gave them everything they could handle Sunday in that tie. Uh, Davis Mills looking like he really could be the Texans quarterback of the future. Another strong showing, 240 yards, two touchdowns after being the highest rated rookie passer last season. Did you hear me? The highest rated rookie passer last season. Houston now two and two and one in his last five starts. Brandon Cooks, another perennially underrated, underreacted to wide receiver. He had seven grabs for 82 yards. OJ Howard is there. He caught both of Mills' touchdown passes. And veteran pass rusher Jerry Hughes came up with two sacks and an interception. Listen, I know it was a tie, but I think this performance should be enough to get Texans fans excited about this team. We're going to look back. Here's what I think. They got the Broncos this week. Do they do they make Russell over? They might. They might do that. 
This is a team like the Lions that's going to keep other teams out of the playoffs. This is a team we're going to look back and we're not just going to be pissed that we have to do the math on a TI-89 calculator about how to deal with the tie when it comes to the playoff picture. We're going to think, man, they played spoiler and they brought it every week. Uh, all right, the last one I want to get to is the Dolphins defense because we've got to get into this. Uh, listen, there was... A lot of focus on 2-1 Tyreek and a lot of game ball Mike McDaniel action when the Dolphins took down the Pats, but the Dolphins' defense is why. And so we have to get into it. Xavier Howard continues to make his case for being the best corner in the NFL and the corner no one ever talks about or considers. Javon Holland had an interception. Miami has Baltimore this week. This is a huge, huge test for Lamar Jackson, who I just told you had a lot of success. Of course, that was against the Jets, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, the Dolphins' defense could be legit. I'm not going to completely say that and buy all in. I do, those players that I mentioned are obviously amazing pieces. Huge tests, and that's the game I'm, want, I'm most looking forward to seeing uh, this week. Okay, we will be back because we've got fantasy decisions. Listen, Trey Lance, if you drafted him as your starter, I, I don't know what to tell you. If you want to play him in daily fantasy over at FanDuel, I got words for you. Does Aaron Rodgers have you in shambles after week one? It's Panic Room next. Mark Ingram, Joe Thomas on the show. I mean, come on, this is amazing. And fantasy seasons are underway. It's my favorite thing, it's my passion. And so I'm here to tell you that it's only natural. It is okay to feel itchy and nervous after suboptimal week one fantasy performances. Let's figure out whether or not you should be in panic mode on some players. That's right, we are playing the panic room with some of these guys. First up. Okay, this is, a, this is a panic room? This is like a, a club in Vegas. Look at this. Unbelievable. Cam Akers, he's the first guy. The Bills defense completely shut down Cam Akers. This was brutal. It really was. He had three total touches, totaling zero yards. Fantasy owners, I'm going to hit the panic button. Welcome to the panic room. Daryl Henderson played 55 snaps to Akers 12. McVay talked about wanting to see more of a sense of urgency out of Cam after the game. There's clips of him whiffing in Pras Pro. That was making the rounds last week. It's not going to help get him more opportunities. And there are questions about whether or not he even returned completely healthy from that Achilles injury last season. Listen, the O-line, not particularly inspiring. So the injury to the rookie, Kyron Williams, doesn't really play, does play in his favor. You know, they don't have a ton of depth, so hopefully that works out. But Cam has a lot of work to do, in my opinion, if he wants to take over Daryl Henderson. All right, we don't have to stay. We can, we can, yeah, we can come hang out with me here. Perfect. Who else is up? Trey Lance? People are panicking. He went to Chicago. There's a monsoon. I'm not going to worry about it. He didn't put up great numbers. I say I'm not going to panic. He's not going into this Vegas club here. I need to see Lance in clean conditions before that. I am actually encouraged by the fact that he ran the ball 13 times for 55 yards uh, because that kind of rushing upset on your fantasy and out of your fantasy quarterback is incredible. This was only his third start, and he averaged over 12 carries per game in that span over those three games. You want that. So let's roll him out there again against the Seahawks. Don't Definitely don't drop him. If you want to play somebody else, if you don't want to take the risk of, on him in your fantasy lineup, then don't. But definitely let him see if he can do his thing uh, up against Seattle. Okay, Pittsburgh Steelers offense. Oof. Not only did Najee Harris only have 26 total yards, he left the game with an injury. Uh, this is a panic button I hit before this season. I couldn't hit it hard enough. Full panic mode on him. Uh, he just casually dropped the existence of this Liz Franck injury in the preseason. Nobody was saying it's a big deal. Clearly, it was big. It's clearly limiting him, and he had to leave the game early. This is an injury, and I'm no doctor, but just my fantasy football acumen, it lingers. It lingers. He's a running back. Do the math yourself. So, and it's honestly, it's cost guys their entire seasons in the past. I hope that's not the case with Najee, but you got to get some help there. You got to draft Jalen, the rookie. Uh, Patriots this weekend, he's saying he's playing. I'm nervous. All right, last but not least, Christian McCaffrey. You drafted him number one or number two overall, and he gave you 57 total yards. He did get a touchdown, so you might not, you know, he's probably mad he's even on this list. But let's stay strong, people. He did find the end zone, uh, and he looked good, really good. When he scooped up that fumble, he took it off for a 32-yard gain uh, that, by the way, nobody got credit for. What kind of rules are those? What, what is that? Uh, he looked awesome. He looked good out in space. He looked like McCaffrey again. Panthers offense as a whole, a mess early on. They weren't on the field a ton. If Baker gets more comfortable, and I think he will, I think CMC is going to thrive. All right, let's move on to a former Bear, former Jaguar, guy who always puts up points in Allen Robinson. Let's do it. 
Let's go to Ellen Robinson. Can we see? Up, up, up. Let's keep going. Do we have Ellen Robinson? I mean, this is the guy who everyone thinks is going to be a comeback darling this year, right? Uh, Cooper Cup got all the love, and Matthew Stafford completely ignored him. And people had takes about that. He had two targets. Uh, I'm going to run to the panic room and I'm locking the door. I'm locking the door because, listen, he put up 410 yards and one touchdown last year. You have to be concerned. Two targets on 65 snaps. And the film of his route running when he didn't get the ball, this is what I'm hearing from my friends who break it on film, not inspiring, okay? And neither was Stafford. There's concerns about his elbow. I'm going to hold out hope because I know how good he can be, but I'm terrified of what his fantasy future might hold after that debut. Last but not least, Aaron Rodgers. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Not the best start to the fantasy season or the real season for you Packers fans who I love out there. We've seen this before. I'm going to do the whole Aaron Rodgers relax thing. He doesn't get to go in the panic room. He's frolicking among dandelions in a field somewhere. Uh, let's not forget he had a horrific debut. Week one, we all know that. Two interceptions, not good. Threw a pick in this one. Like I said earlier, Vikings defense is just really good. And we're talking about one of the greatest to ever do it. He's been a top 10 fantasy quarterback every season. Win healthy, be patient. By the way, you took him as like your backup quarterback. He was going outside the top 12 in drafts, which was absurd. So he will figure it out. All right, I don't know what the tease is for the rest of the show. I know we're doing pony up on some of the biggest matchups. Uh, Conrad, what else? Oh, we have a stupid segment that we came up with. Let's start after this. Don't go anywhere. FanDuel Casino has a new daily free-to-play game. It's called Reward Machine, and it is a free game that gives players the chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus every day. Log in daily and spin for a free chance at rewards only on FanDuel Casino. A lot of fun on today's show, a future Hall of Famer. Mark Ingram, who is the best, was also here. Joe Thomas was amazing. Uh, and producer Conrad, make me look cool because I'm uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and I keep seeing these x-rays all over the the yeah, just, just, just some guys that got that dog in them. You know what? Let's show them some of these tweets. You know, for example, Josh Allen got that dog in him. And on social media, everybody knows that if you got that dog in him, literally, you got them dogs in you. So what is this? So they're putting, this, this is like, a, this I is mean, like viral. Okay, okay, it's self-explanatory. Josh Allen, four touchdowns last Thursday, stiff arming people going to the end zone. He just got that dog in him. You know what I mean, Kay? You know what I mean when I say it. He got that G dog in him. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay, so this has got it. So people keep Gino. tweeting this. All absolutely. right, can I play? Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's play along. You got any, you got any dogs for week one? How you feel about DeAndre Swift? He got that dog in him, Kay? I think um, he's go I think DeAndre Swift... Got that dog Thank in him. Thank you. Yeah, baby. I mean, no, we got to talk about this. this. This is my favorite game of the weekend that nobody's talking about. And here it is. Career high, 144 rush yards and a touchdown. He was insane the whole first quarter. It was my first, my first taste of NFL Sunday action was watching him do his thing out there. Rushing touchdown. Uh, he had his fourth career game with 100 or more. And you know what, Conrad? The Lions play the Commanders this weekend. Let me tell you this. I did the math. I could not believe this. Uh, they gave up 113 rushing yards, my friend. Uh oh. On yep. 13, no, sorry, on 15 carries. It was like seven point something yards per pop. Unbelievable. So I'm a little worried, and I think we might see Swift go off again because he. Got that dog in him. You know what? Let's check. Let's check the x ray. Oh, it's confirmed. Oh, it is confirmed, is. Kay. Yeah. He does have that dog in him. <laughs> Brian Barton's dying. What do you got? Who you got? No, oh, I mean, my. Who got that dog in him? I, this guy definitely got that dog in him. He's a Georgia Bulldog, first and foremost. Tay Crowder. Let's roll, roll the tape. Tay Crowder. How many people do you know can do this to Derrick Henry? Tay Crowder definitely got that dog in him. Not many guys could uh, move the human Mack truck like that, but he did. We have all these different angles. Look at this, K. Off his feet? Who takes Derrick Henry off his feet? No way you can do yeah, that no, unless yeah. you have that dog in you, yeah, right? Yeah, he's got that dog in him, in fact. This is so, I'm so weird. What? Uh, can we do, there Oh, there it is. It is. Oh, look okay. at that dog you got hey, in him, Can we do one more? Yeah, let's, look how, you know Look what? how cool and internet-y we are. Let's we're do it. So, let's let's, let's so, do one more. We're so happening. You know who I think? Who got that dog in him, Kay? Tell Justin me. Jefferson. Oh, and Justin he might Jefferson all year. got that dog. He might all year. He had the, was the highest scoring fantasy receiver. This was a career high game, 184 against the Packers. Sorry, Packers fans watching these highlights. Uh, and you just couldn't cover him. And, I, and I'm yelling about Alexander and how we should be blanketing him and all that. And then Darius Butler's yelling at me, Conrad, as we bring you back on screen here. Uh, he was amazing. And I have the feeling that he's going to be, as I, let's get Conrad back up, player, please. Uh, <laughs> I think that he is 
full Cooper Cup in this offense, meaning it's, you know, all every game is going to be annoying and the same. We're, we're all going to put our hands on our head. You know how that happens at the bar when you're doing this? And you just are saying, why is he open? How oh. is he that open? And we're going to say that literally every week, including, and you know I love the Eagles, you know I love the Eagles, this week because they gave up, uh, it's Monday Night Football, 144 yards and two touchdowns to those Lions receivers in that really fun game week one. So uh, I don't know if there's a defense that could stop him this year, but this is going to be Justin Jefferson got that dog in him. Oh, he got that dog in him, Kay. He's like Waffle House. He's going to be open 24-7 with Kevin O'Connell as his offensive coach. I mean, I'm telling you, Justin Jefferson, he's wide receiver number one. And you know why, Kay? It's because he got that dog in him. Our little Southern Belle. Uh, do we got to get out of here? We got to get out of here. Right. <laughs> he's like, get out of here. We'll be back. We have Andrew Filipponi joining us. We'll talk a little Steelers, maybe some TJ Watt implications, previewing the season. And we are going to pony up on this week's best picks. It's all after this right here on Up and Adams. Tweet the show. Can you believe it's already week two? It starts tomorrow night. Chiefs hosting the Chargers. You can earn a share of 15 grand in cash prizes courtesy of FanDuel and Amazon Prime Video. Enter the Prime Video Pick'em by answering 10 questions about the game. Fans who answer the most questions correctly win a share of 15,000 in cash prizes. This looks fun and it looks kind of easy. FanDuel.com to enter. We're going to start with Trubisky. And this offensive line is in tatters, Kay. You watch the Bengals give up 50 sacks and get Joe Burrow killed. Mitch Trubisky better you know, tighten his cleats in this game and get ready to run because the Steelers have nothing up front. Their quarterbacks got killed all preseason. Andrew Filipponi welcoming <laughs> him back to the show. You can hear him on 93.7 The Fan in Pittsburgh and, of course, right here all over FanDuel TV. What would you make of that? Uh, I want that one back. I want a mulligan. On that one. That's not a great first impression for me to make with you, Kay. No, it was Joe Burrow who was running. Yeah. Seven sacks, hit 11 times, uh, four interceptions. It was an incredible performance by the Steelers' defense. It certainly was, and I like the Bengals. They should have lost the game by 30, and then I would worry, but they almost, I mean, the Steelers almost blew that game with five turnovers. Yeah. Give me a break. All right, we're doing a segment called Pony Up. I'm going to give you some futures bets, and you're going to tell me if you would pony up for it or not. Steelers to win the AFC North. That is a big pony down. Uh, I'm doubling down on the hometown team here. Uh, T.J. Watt's going to miss at least six weeks with this torn pec. Uh, okay, it's not torn off the bone, so that means it's not a season-ending surgery. But they're a team that is so reliant on defense. Their offense had 230 total yards. N Najee Harris is bothered by not just a Liz Frank, but a high ankle sprain. And he averaged under two and a half yards per carry in this game. Right now on FanDuel, they are currently 6-1 to one to win the division, the longest odds. And I agree. I still think right now they're a team that finishes probably 8-9. and nine. So ponying down on that one. The Steelers have finished at least second in the North in nine straight seasons, four division titles over that span. Uh, Jags to make playoffs? Yes, pony up. This is one of my favorite bets on FanDuel. Get on board with me, Kay, plus 430. For Jacksonville, I get it. They lost to Carson Wentz in Washington on the road. They haven't won a road game in more than two years. But Trayvon Walker came in and had a sack and an interception of Wentz in his debut as the number one overall pick. The Colts tied and the Titans lost at home to the Giants. Jacksonville is a four and a half point underdog at home against Indianapolis, K. If they win that game, their odds to make the playoffs and win the division are going to be much improved. And I think they can and will. I like Jacksonville as a sleeper. I don't know. I heard what you said about Lamar Jackson being tired last week, and then he lit up those jets, my friend. I'm listening to you, though, and I'm learning, honestly learning so much. Uh, what should we do now? Let's do, let's do uh, Justin Jefferson, Offensive Player of the Year. Are you ponying up? I am, and the odds have skyrocketed up on him, too. He's now the favorite to win it at 6-1. to one. What he did in the first half, 156 yards, 184 overall in the game, in that Kevin O'Connell offense where they're going to open things up with Kirk Cousins. You got Aaron Rodgers after the game saying, you were the best player on the field. These are narrative-driven awards a lot of times, Kay. What we say in the media, what players say, counts a lot in the minds of the voters. Another primetime game for Minnesota on Monday. If Jefferson balls out against Philadelphia, those odds are only going to get worse. So I'd lock it in now at 6-1. to one. 
Jefferson leads the NFL in receiving yards. He's tied already in total touchdowns. We'll see how it goes. But like I said, no defense is going to be able to stop him this year. He's going to operate like Cooper Cup. We're all going to be saying, why is he so open every week this season? Uh, Jalen Hurts, you know I love the Eagles. And uh, Joe Thomas, future Hall of Famer, said the Eagles have the best offensive line in the yeah. game. He said that on our show today, out of all 32, what do you make of them? And Jalen Hurts is an MVP. Well, I like the Eagles against the Lions. Then a backdoor cover special by Philadelphia Whoa. late. Three points uh, they lose by. The spread was three and a half in a lot of places on FanDuel especially, so that did not help. Uh, I like Hurts as a dual threat. We've seen those guys like Lamar Jackson win the award. However, my value play, I am ponying up on Matt Stafford here at 20 to 1. Right. Why? Because look at what happened last year, Kay. Aaron Rodgers had a lousy first game. There was big value on him after that, and he was great. Gangbusters after that week one struggle against the Saints. I think the same thing happens with Elbow. Stafford. The Rams will have a huge game against the Falcons. You're not worried about this thing? <laughs> a little bit. A tiny bit, but not enough to pass up 20-1 to 1 value on Sean McVay, Matt Stafford, and Cooper Cup. Uh, Russell Wilson, NFL passing yards leader. We're running up against the clock, as you know. What do you got? I love it. Because we saw with Nate Hackett, they're going to air the ball out. Passing yards leaders are not always players on great teams. In fact, three of the past four years, Kay, the passing yards leader has come from a team that missed the playoffs. I think Denver's going to open it up with Wilson. Maybe 5,000 passing yards for him this year. His career high in passing yards was 4,219. That was back in the year 2016. So that would be Mahomes' career low over a course of a healthy season. I thought that was super, super interesting. We'll see uh, what happens. Hey, are you wearing a wire? bro what's happening <laughs> what are you like attached can you move your head at all or are you about to like ruin an entire situation I, I, I have I'm wearing an earpiece from like 1977 <laughs> for this segment plan a went out the window about 20 minutes ago so I'm stuck in like 1960s TV right now okay I kind of love it I hope you're wearing shorts like you know I hope you're not like you're not fully suited right I have beautiful khakis on right. I'd stand up but I'm afraid with the wire yeah, that gonna, everything would break it's a yeah. bad idea uh, Andrew Filipponi you are awesome we appreciate to you. We've got big guests tomorrow. How do you follow up today with Sean Merriman, Dante Hall in studio, and Eric Weddle, Chiefs, Chargers, Thursday Night Football. We'll be here in the morning. Tweet the show. We will be tweeting out the whole show on YouTube after this. Uh, so check it out. Bye, guys.